So now let's get started to today's presentation, Libraries and Publishers, Libraries as Publishers. We have two guests whose libraries have taken the publishing plunge, so to speak, uh, in different ways, of course. Dean Hendricks is the Assistant Director of University Libraries at the University of Buffalo. As Assistant Director, he coordinates communications, assessment, library systems, and entrepreneurial and experimental services. Sorrel Oberlander has been the Director of Milne Library at the State University of New York at Geneseo since January 2011, and he is the Principal Investigator for the Open SUNY Textbook Project. They will talk about just one part of the many experiences they've had with publishing. They'll be talking about textbooks. As they make their presentations, as Dietra said, we welcome your questions. Just write them in the chat box on your computer, and we'll be answering them after each person's presentation, and then, of course, have uh, opportunity at the end for final questions. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dean. And Dean, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? I'll just get a yes from one person. All right. Great. All right. Um, thank you, Kathy, for uh, the introduction. And I also, it uh, goes without saying, thanks uh, to Deirdre for coordinating the nuts and bolts of this webinar. Um, at the University of Buffalo Libraries, over the last two years, we've run four distinct types of e-textbook pilots that have reached over 4,000 of our students, mostly undergrads. Um, the pilots that I'm going to be discussing today aren't necessarily library as publisher, but they do offer a nice entree into the current e-textbook landscape, and especially as libraries are working, trying to work with publishers in this space. So do you recognize this quote? I look forward to buying college textbooks each and every semester. Of course you don't. Um, regardless of what this slide says, said no one ever is not a freshman at UB. Um, this is a, a big deal for students right now. They are revolting because of the prices being so ridiculous. And here are some of the stats that you may have run into as a librarian or perhaps a consumer, maybe as a student or as a parent. And I know um, I'm going to leave this most of this to Cyril to talk about in, in his presentation. Um, but one of the things that I find most enlightening in, in working over two, uh, two years with our faculty is that faculty generally are not interested in the nuances of the textbook market. If given the option between checking a box on a bookstore postcard or working outside their comfort zone throughout the semester to save their students money and to improve their, their learning outcomes, the postcard still wins. So this is an uphill battle. And part of it you can even see with, with libraries. We've always had a rocky relationship. I mean, part of this rocky relationship is we have not moved on. This is a uh, New York Times article from 1901. It could be from, from 2014 um, that we are denying textbooks. We haven't found a real way to engage these issues head on. Um, but why should we? Well, first, our users expect it. Um, if anybody who's worked in interlibrary alone it, it understands that textbooks are being requested by our students. And then secondly, this is a priority of higher education, not just on your campuses, but nationally. This is something that uh, students, parents are discussing, as well as university administrators, your presidents and provosts, as well as President Obama when he came to UB and spoke. So regardless of the rocky relationship or your personal preference, you know, how I see here all the people, well, I could never read on a screen and all of these type of things. And, and regardless of what articles that have been cited, e-textbooks are coming. And are, your, are, are we ready? Um, right now, they're about 10 to 15 percent of the market, but that trend line is rising. And from our student interviews and data, the only thing that's holding e-textbooks back from what I would think would be uh, close to universal adoption is the reading experience. And you're saying, oh, yeah, just the reading experience, just the little reading experience. Well, actually, you know, um, reading is significant. So, but for other uses of the textbook, reference, searching, navigation, study efficiency, assessing your learning, students by far prefer the electronic. And as we know, technology doesn't stand still. Screens and displays are going to get better. 
um, it becomes a no-brainer as displays become better and more paper-like that students are going to adopt the electronic uh, textbook due to the native advantages of the format. And from our research here with 4,000 students, the predominant way they access e-textbooks is through a laptop. And we've all, I don't know if you've tried to read a, a book on a laptop, it's, it's difficult. So um, as these displays get better, um, we, we see uh, adoption rates uh, increasing uh, really, really quickly. So why libraries? Well, I really firmly believe libraries are the heart of the campus, and I don't mean the building. I mean our people. We have relationships that span the campus that uh, most units and decanal units do not have uh, on your campus. And these wide-ranging relationships, coupled with our expertise in licensing electronic products, makes this current textbook crisis kind of a, a real opportunity for us. Um, a real opportunity for us to get involved in something that matters to all our constituencies. Um, I'll, I'll just give a word of warning. Um, if you don't have, if your libraries don't have fundamental relationships with your <laughs> strong relationship with your faculty, students, IT, legal counsel, bookstores, accessibility offices, you're going to have a hard time pulling off any sort of campus-wide implementation. Um, but if you do have these relationships, it, it actually is a way to fundamentally change uh, not just library services, but the whole higher ed enterprise. So we approach this through three uh, ways. Um, so broadly speaking, there are these three ways of affordability that we've explored. Um, first, and what I'm going to mainly focus on, is negotiation with textbook publishers. Um, we explored how we can leverage large student population for di deep discounts. We explored business models that make sense for campuses. So that means we're not just cost shifting. We're not just saying, you know, here, here you go, students. Uh, we, we really want some real uh, uh, interesting models. Um, uh, or cost shifting to the libraries, I should say, not to the students. Um, we explored institutional. Uh, we explored um, uh, negotiating through SUNY we, uh, using that. Uh, we explored uh, uh, going through Internet 2 and, and, and a variety of big what we call AAU universities in trying, and trying. And some of these, um, these models included negotiating licenses on behalf of students, site licenses. We've explored course-based fees. Uh, and you probably know where fees get us, but um, universal textbook fees for all students, pay-per-view models, and then the last is e-textbook as financial aid. The second approach is going to be discussed by Cyril the Open, and we have been really closely aligned with Cyril throughout this uh, project, uh, and, and he's been a great partner and, and really knows his stuff on the Open, and so I'm going to leave that to him. Uh, the last approach can't be underestimated either. It's information disclosure, and typically, uh, people mentioned the Higher Education Opportunity Act, which says basically that schools have to have to post textbook pricing information that's required and recommended for each class. Um, but I like to look at it also as another way: it is an information disclosure piece from the library side is to proactively let instructors know what exists in the library's collection to kind of scan those syllabi and take a look and and and. Uh, suggest things. Obviously, there's academic freedom issues, but hey, there's nothing against uh, academic suggestion. We're all colleagues here. So, uh, and also, what's available free on the web uh, is great. All right. So, um, in deploying these e-textbook pilots at, at UB, we kind of explored these key questions. And I'm just quickly, these, this was kind of one of our charges. Um, what are the features? Obviously, if you've used any textbook, you know, highlight, searching, annotating, and to a lesser extent, reflowable text, which just means that you know, the text shows, uh, uh, displays correctly on any sort of device that you may have. Multimedia and built-in assessment are, are some of the emerging features. Do students like or want e-textbook? We have tons of data on this. Like I said, and longitudinal data, if you consider two years longitudinal. Um, it's trending, yes. They, they, they are increasingly preferring uh, e-textbooks um, due to price. Now, price being the big factor, and I can sh I have this graph that's great, where if price is the same between the two books, it's between P and E, uh, 7 out of 10 prefer P. You just lower the price 25%, it's 7 out of 10 prefer E. So uh, with the price points of electronic, uh, uh, they do prefer that. Um, can e-textbooks lower prices? Yes, like I said, it's not rocket science uh, uh, to say that, you know, 
the virtual infrastructure uh, uh, lets us have lower marginal costs for, for E. Um, they're much less. There's not, a, not a, a physical infrastructure you're having to maintain. So yes, even though publishers will tell you they're just, I had one publisher actually look me in the eye and tell me that, um, uh, that it was the same. And uh, at that point, my, my intelligence was insulted. Um, what are the sustainable business models? Well, that's still up for grab, and that's part of what we're working. And I, all I can really say is that our definition of sustainable um, is not even close to the publisher's definition of sustainable. So we have to find some middle ground if we're going to work with publishers. Um, improved learning outcomes, absolutely. Um, I think that most of the literature points to no significant difference. So, uh, uh, so you can take that at, at face value. And where, where does the library fit? Um, this is an area that, that keeps growing. And our users don't understand our Rocky relationship or why we don't have these, and nor should we expect to. So again, I think this is a way for us to leverage our licensing expertise and uh, uh, our, our experience with publishers. So the four distinct uh, e-textbook pilots we've run uh, have been course-based, student-based, multi-campus, and site license. Now, we're all familiar with the fourth site license, traditionally, like our, our, our databases. The course base is, is the most common, the number one. Um, it's students in participating class are giving free access to the electronic version of the, of the textbook. You have student-based, which is, I think, a, a kind of an interesting model, an innovative model, where, where students are given free ac access to a platform and then allowed to pick out of hundreds or thousands of books and be able to put them up on their bookshelf so that they, can, they, they have. It would be more like the Spotify method of, of uh, model of uh, distributing e textbook. And then you have multi campus. Can we get, for example, SUNY together that has uh, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of students across and leverage those enormous numbers to, to get discounts? So uh, we had a grant through SUNY, through the SUNY's Provost Office, uh, to explore that. So the impact that our pilots have had, they're, they're pretty significant. I, I, you know, when I talk to people about e-textbook pilots, I think people expect me to say, oh yeah, well we did this pilot with the 26 students in this one class. Actually, we're, we're over 4,000 students. We've been in over 15 classes um, in a variety of courses and disciplines, anything from uh, nursing to uh, engineering, uh, to uh, world civilization. We've, we've learned a lot about their use and preferences and attitudes towards. And we've, we've used uh, course load and course smart. Those are the two bigger uh, platforms that we've, we've used. And of course, we, we, we found savings in the pilots. I should qualify it. Um, you can see with the, with financially, we saved anywhere between 50 and 90 percent, and depending on, on the type of pilot. Um, but we all know that list price is, is, is a fantasy, right? It's a made-up price. If you ask any textbook author you know, how their textbook is priced, they're going to say they have absolutely no idea. They don't know about this, the, the, the fantasy of this list price. So really when I'm saying, oh, we saved 87% off of new list, 87% off some fantasy number, actually what would be actually better for us would be to know how much we are saving, and we're working on this, how to save off of used, print used, which is the actual predominant way we found at least students at UB acquire their textbooks. So um, we're looking at a lower price point um, when we're looking at that. Um, but with these discounts, the promise of these discounts, you can see why this, this becomes attractive for us to, to start the, these conversations with publishers. However, and poor, poor Ashley Wagner, I, I, I also agree with her. Um, national and local negotiations haven't gone so well. Um, it has been all, if you've ever seen the meme of Ashley Wagner, you know what she said. Um, it has been. Uh, uh, there are a few problems. Um, publishers are still pushing the 100% sell-through model, and they're pretty unbending on that. And 100% sell-through means that everybody in the class has to pay, or you have to pay if you're the institution. So you have 40 students, you have to pay for 40 units. Um, that doesn't work uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, which I, I can't even get into today um, due to the limited time. Uh, publishers do not acknowledge that their list price is a made-up price. They will say that their algorithm, and like I said, I even had somebody that say, tell me that E and P should be priced the same. 
Um, after meeting with several of the biggest e-textbook publishers during the summer, and there was a group of Internet 2 schools, including UB and Cornell, Wisconsin, among others, uh, uh, we couldn't even make, you know, these big schools, which you think might be able to throw some weight around, uh, couldn't make headway with the 100% with the uh, uh, sell-through models. The other thing is textbook publishers are also sneakily trying to get in the student data business and create customer loyalty. So these are things that you, uh, if you were to, to venture in this, please contact me or Charles Lyons here at, at UB. We know all the tricks of the trade here uh, uh, with these. So um, uh, things that might be inserted into a contract that uh, may not uh, jive with FERPA regulations. So what am I seeing as a viable options for libraries? Well, at this moment of time, they're limited. Um, one way, I, one uh, method I do see is the Affordable Learning Solutions Rent Digital Model, which is out of Cal State system. It's basically the system is negotiating lower prices, not as low as what we're getting in our pilot, but low enough where a student won't have to comparison shop or scour the web at Amazon or Chegg to try to find the best deal, so that the best deals are available on the rent digital model. Um, and it is a student opt-in model, which is attractive for us. So uh, again, uh, that, that's, that's one way that we can help, but really um, uh, doesn't really uh, allow us to, to have the deep discounts that we've experienced in these pilots. Um, we're also persistently pa and patiently pushing, oh, that was a tongue twister, uh, against the 100% sell-through models, which I think they are, that's unrealistic with the appetite for fees on this campus, and I would, I would also think they're unrealistic on your campus. I, I don't know of a campus that says uh, more fees, please. Um, and, and also, I think uh, I, I said this earlier, we have to make targeted efforts. Um, uh, to make faculty aware of the scope of our collections and encourage the use of free resources, YouTube videos, open access articles, etc., um, for their teaching and courses. And that is, again, part of that relationship building. So uh, with that, the last piece is open educational uh, resources. And like I said, we're, we've been aware of Cyril's pilot for, for a while now. Uh, we were on the original grant. I think actually Charles is still on the, the current grant. Uh, and we've worked together and shared information of both of our pilots to really get a 360 degree view of, of and one of our conclusions uh, from our pilot in working with publishers is that we dedicated a lot of time and really didn't get a lot of bang for our buck, a lot of headway. Um, a lot of our students, these, this was funded by grants from our provost and from SUNY, but this is not a sustainable model that we were looking at. And with the discounts uh, being offered by publishers, it's not sustainable for us. So with our limited time and the limited talent that we, I mean, well, I don't mean limited like librarians are limited in talent, but the limited uh, time of our talent, I should say, uh, we want to develop, we should probably spend a more time uh, looking at things like Cyril's, op uh, Cyril's open textbook program, open solutions that, open access solutions that address the textbook crisis. So with that uh, kind of entree into Cyril, I hope that was a good prologue for him. Um, I'm going to turn, mute my uh, microphone. Uh, are we doing questions right now? I'll We're just, going I'll to do questions right now. We'll do okay. questions, awesome. and uh, if anybody has any questions, I remind you that you can um, write them in the chat box. Um, Dean, I was wondering if you are moving beyond the pilot phase for any of the uh, four areas that you mentioned. Moving beyond the pilot phase on any, well, we still, um, no. Uh, only be, not because we don't think it's valuable. Um, I think the funding isn't there from higher levels um, to, to make this. And like I said, we didn't want to shift costs, like shift costs to libraries. Libraries certainly couldn't afford this on our own. Um, we don't want to shift costs to us. Um, uh, we gathered this information to for our provost and, and the financial offices in our university administration and let them t try to look to look at this. We are still presenting to, to campus administrators, and I think one of the promising things is possibly uh, e-textbooks as financial aid. So that's one of those kind of more creative out of the box that uh, uh, we've talked to publishers about, and boy, 
they had never heard that before, so I think we, we, we made their heads spin a little bit there when we were talking about that. But as far as um, uh, us going to using any of these models as sustainable, you'd have to have either a course fee or a universal textbook fee to, uh, to have this. One of the interesting questions we asked our students was would you pay, in the student-based model where they get access to the platform, is how much would you pay for this platform after using it for a semester? 45% said they wouldn't pay anything for it. And that's about how much they're willing to spend on textbooks. And about 50% said under $200. Now, coincidentally, uh, or maybe good marketing, they've done their research, CourseSmart offered a, a new program that gave uh, students the access to their platform for six textbooks, and they priced it right at $200. So they obviously had done their market research, and we've, we've kind of, our students also kind of fit in to right into that model. Okay, that's very interesting. And we, you're sharing your information with the uh, provost at UB. What about at SUNY? Is this information going up further? Yeah, I mean, we, we uh, had an IITG grant. We're, we're filing our reports. Our reports are in uh, the SUNY Learning Commons, so they're, they're right. accessible to anybody. Um, I mean, I, I think that might be a question that John Schumacher and, and his office could, could answer better what, what you know, their, their vision for uh, collaborative. But we're offering reports to John and, and to the SUNY provost, and, uh, uh, you know, we definitely feel like um, uh, we haven't had as much success as we'd like um, negotiating discounts across um, uh, campuses. But I think maybe that, that is because of the limited amount of money that, that we've had. Remember, we really feel like um, we've, the, true va the true discounts come when you leverage the full student population. And only had, I think we applied for two $20,000 grants. And that just wasn't enough, enough incentive for Course Smart and the variety of different course load and the variety of publishers to give us the deep discounts. Even when we said, hey, we're the pilot, and hey, SUNY's either the first or second biggest system in the country. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think they're, they, they don't want to uh, set a bad, they don't want to set a precedent where, where we're expecting these discounts. OK, and we have a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, asks, the 7 out of 10 pr that prefer p-text if the price is the same with 20% reduction, 7 out of 10 would uh, prefer e-text. Is that based on your 4,000 student experience? Yes, that is. That, that is. It's, a, it's an interesting graph. And when it gets up to, it's actually 25%. When it gets to 50%, so you're just talking half, half of the price, which is completely realistic to think about an e-textbook e being 50% of the price of a print textbook. Um, when it gets to 50%, it's 9 out of 10 students. So it is quite price. One of the things we've, we found with students, obviously, the prime motivator is not their learning outcomes. Surprise, it's cost of their education. So uh, uh, that was the prime motivator when, uh, of, of all, all the factors that go into to choosing a textbook. And Nancy Russell asks, has these, this affected the university's library collection development uh, policy, or uh, maybe the question is, will it, do you think? Um, well, has it? No. Um, I think we're working that out. We're doing a lot of purchase on, on demand uh, pilots, which is a totally different uh, uh, arm from this. This was kind of a standalone, uh, uh, and it didn't really affect collection, our, our traditional collection development. Uh, will it affect? Well, I think we need to figure out what we need to do about textbooks. Um, whether it's going office to office to, and, and demanding of all of our faculty to talk to the publishers to give them free versions for reserves, or um, doing something about it with licensing uh, like we've tried to do. Uh, we have to do something. This is giving students fail. Students don't understand our, our value proposition uh, with collections, generally, um, at least in our, our data. They, they, they know our space as well. Uh, but the collections, and w when we decline them every time on interlibrary loan, you know, no, we can't, this is a textbook, no, it's on reserve, that means you have to walk into the library and come get it. Um, there's a real, there's some fundamental bad customer service going on there. Yeah. Okay. And John Schumacher has uh, posted the link to the dean's, uh, uh, regarding dean's comments from the provost. So uh, that's 
that is up on the chat if people see that, so they can link to that. So, um, Dean, thank you so much. It's very interesting. I'm sure there are other questions that uh, will come up, and people should feel free to email uh, questions to. Um, they can e email them to me, I guess, and I'll forward them. K Miller at rrlc.org. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Sorrel. So welcome, Sorrel. Hello, everyone. That was great, Dean. It was wonderful to see how much work the University of Buffalo has done trying to make textbooks more affordable. So thank you very much for your work and um, your promotion of our program. I'm glad you're a PI on this, a co-PI. The Open SUNY textbooks, thank you for everyone who wants to hear about this. This is really about libraries and faculty working together on a crisis, on a, on a serious problem, but also developing some innovative solutions. Thankfully, libraries and a SUNY Instruction Technology Grant funded the first two pilots that I'm going to talk about. Now we'll start with why open textbooks? I think a lot of us already just heard why. Um, they're very expensive. Uh, in 2003, it was a $6.5 billion industry, but more importantly, the cost to students have increased dramatically. They've increased for tuition as well. Florida did a nice study of 22,000 students to say, what are you doing as, as an impact on the cost of textbooks? Well, 64% of them said that they don't at times buy their textbooks. This is really indicative that the cost of textbooks are impacting their learning and we can't afford that. So what are we going to do about it? We're essentially trying to create a win-win. We're trying to empower teaching and learning and teachers and learners by creating textbooks, publishing textbooks with our faculty. Now, for a lot of you, it sounds like it's a paper print textbook, and, and in, in many ways it can be seen as that. But it's much more. A textbook is an assemblage of a lot of text, audio, video, interactives, learning analytics, much like what's happening in the MOOC world, in the learning management systems. But what Open Textbooks really provides us is a vehicle to create shared reusable digital assets. That's at the center of what I think of as an online learning environment that we're creating. And we're really doing it for faculty and students and libraries. OK, now how do we start off? Well, we got a $20,000 grant in July of 2012. And five libraries, with a sixth one joining us in January, really wanted to call, uh, send a call for authors to our faculty. It was sent out to 34,000 faculty across SUNY on November 2012. We basically offered $3,000 if somebody would author an open textbook if we selected it. Little did we know that in two weeks we would receive 38 proposals. The grant limited us to four titles. So one of the best things to see about libraries is they were willing to chip in additional funding to fund 15. There's a variety of subjects, and that was with intention. We really wanted to explore what does it mean to publish in these variety of disciplines, and how do we affect um, this new publishing as libraries model? Well, first it's by developing an editorial workflow. We shaped not only how we asked authors to send us manuscripts, but we managed the peer review. We provided the reviewer comments to the author. We provided either copy editing as librarians or as consultants hired freelance. We did the managing of the messaging. We worked with the authors. We did the text layout, which is the production part of it, the final proofing. Libraries can, and librarians can, do all of the editorial workflow that it takes to produce a high-quality online open textbook. Now, we produce our textbooks as PDFs and EPUBs on Open Monograph Press, which is a software that was developed by the Public Knowledge Project. This manages a lot of the editorial workflow, the messaging between reviewer and author, the author submits the work using OMP, and uh, we manage this process this way. Once we publish the work, we actually catalog it in WorldCat. We 
this uh, recommended for cataloging at the Minnesota Open Textbook Catalog, and we're going to be cataloging in Merlot next. We also offer the authors a PDF that's ready to go into Amazon's CreateSpace so that they can make a print edition because we know many uh, students still want to handle a print book, which is wonderful. Any of the royalties goes to the author and it's not part of our service, but we're happy to help the authors in getting more from their publication, their work. Now, what does this open textbook look like? Here's an example of uh, Dr. Stu Susan Stebbins' Native Peoples of North America. It's one of four textbooks. We just released a soft launch, a fourth title called Real Analysis. Very exciting uh, Fredonia uh, title. But the textbooks are PDF or EPUBs. The EPUBs are easier for mobile devices. The inside the cover, there is a peer review included inside the textbook because we think it's really critical for teaching faculty to quickly evaluate an open textbook and make a decision. Do they want this to adopt this or not? So that's why we did the peer review inside of it. Thank goodness libraries are still wanting to do this and SUNY provided a 60,000 renewal grant using the Innovative Instruction Technology Grant to do a second pilot which is in progress. You see the number of libraries now has increased plus we've had the support of many other libraries in the process and I'll explain that in a second. We have SUNY Press that uh, serves as a consultant on our project and it's wonderful to have a university press describing their editorial workflow and advising us and being a part of this uh, wonderful process of publishing textbooks. The process that we just launched for Pilot 2 is I think very interesting because we sent out the call for authors we got 46 proposals on January 31st, and now, although we're funded to publish 16, we wanted to develop a selection process that really engages the teaching faculty and the librarians in a discussion about open educational resources and sort of a market analysis. So in their submissions, they gave us blind, uh, a abstract that was for blind review which means no uh, names or no institution affiliation. And we developed a rubric that is available for teaching faculty in the same discipline at other institutions to evaluate this manuscript proposal. So faculty are starting to return these evaluations of how clear was the abstract, how likely would you select this textbook um, if we publish it, and more importantly, what are critical features that you'd like to see in a textbook like this? And also, would you be willing to serve as a peer reviewer? The librarians at these 14 institutions are working with their faculty so that it really starts an engaging conversation. But for us, it compiles the scores or the evaluations across many institutions. It, it allows us to look at strengths, where could it be improved, and essentially provide us the market analysis for adoption. Lastly, it also makes it easier to find peer reviewers in the same discipline. Making this a more collaborative approach has been one of the key parts of this project. This is just a very general timeline for a second pilot. Pilot 1 is still publishing the, its first 15 textbooks. It's now done four and it's going to be completing the rest by about June. The second pilot starts off with the call of authors and now it's in the selection review and it'll be going until September of 2015. With 16 or more textbooks, we're looking at publishing about 31 to or more textbooks by September of 2015. Ambitious, but it gets even more interesting. What's really behind a lot of this constructing a publishing program for libraries isn't just how do we develop this catalog of PDFs and EPUBs in here. It's also important to know that we want to improve how teaching faculty interact with 
our textbooks at a textbook level, a chapter level, or even an object level, and how their students engage with it in the learning analytics. All of this is sort of the infrastructure that we look as longer term about what Open SUNY Textbook is about and how it would support the faculty and students at SUNY and beyond, because this is an open environment. I want to say that there are a lot of lessons learned. Um, the pilots are extremely important as learning opportunities. It has given us a real good idea about what it is to be publishing. Working together really builds a community and scale. We know, now know of many librarians who are interested in not only publishing, but also interested in copy editing or proof uh, reading or instructional design with our faculty. Well, that's wonderful. Important also is that we are familiar enough to our faculty as authors so that they see us behaving like publishers and they respond accordingly. But we are not a university press. We're trying to create something new, and that's the important lesson here, too. Now, we see publishing service as a valued new role for libraries, but it's an innovative role that really needs clarity and professional development. We need to develop the courses on what does copy editing mean, and what does proofreading mean, and how do we support our faculty in producing this or adopting these. Um, for other purposes, project management and a manager are essential for this kind of a large-scale project. Trying to publish 31 textbooks in, the, in the, you know, about a two-year, three-year period is an extraordinary feat. And I am so in admire of what librarians are capable across the SUNY system and beyond. But we have to also keep the whole environment in mind, and what I mean is, it's going to come down to adoption is key. First off, the open textbooks have to be adopted by teaching faculty for their own reasons. It has to be high quality. It has to have a workflow like the bookstore, like Dean mentioned, a, a postcard. It has to have the quizzes. It has to be easy to assign. Rather than assigning a textbook two months in advance so that they can order the print copies right away, it's great that an open SUNY textbook is a URL that could be simply placed on the LMS, or that you could buy a print version from Amazon and get it in two days. Publishing has to be adopted by authoring faculty. They, they need to find a way to be engaged in this process that really matters. Students, it's easy. If it reduces costs, it will lead to more engaged reading and improved learning. Also, most importantly, is adoption about new publishing roles to libraries and librarians. Do we see ourselves in these capacities, in these roles? And if we do, we can really empower teaching and learning in new ways and provide new value. I think these are important questions or strategies or concerns that we have to really focus in on. And it provides this new value to what colleges are trying to deal with. They're trying to deal with the cost and access to college. And we think libraries as publishing can actually help to solve that. We know that students are very key to promotion of our program and the idea of affordable textbooks. On November 9th, the Student, student Assembly voted on a measure of a resolution of we need solutions to textbook affordability. And in it, they resolved to recognize the open SUNY textbooks. These are important promotions of our work. So too are the faculty early adopters. These are the people who are trying something new and they have a reason to do so. Um, Ted Steinberg did a fantastic job of writing this literature, The Humanities and the Humanity, from SUNY Fredonia. He sees it as making literature more accessible to students, to learners, to people, because in, in many ways, the commercial publishing industry has taken that literature away, and they were a part of it. So he's bringing it back. And 
I really admire the people who are early adopters in this because they can really make a difference here. I went extraordinarily fast, but I wanted to be able to answer questions that you might have about the Open SUNY textbook program. And I appreciate your interest. And take it away, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sorel. It's really great. That's uh, certainly a, a very complete project, very well thought out, and very well executed. We uh, remind everyone that you uh, can put your questions in the chat box. And we do have one question from Nancy, who wants to know, are these books really the same in length and content, et cetera, as uh, a normal textbook? That's a fantastic question. Um, some of the new textbooks are about 800 pages. Um, these range between 150 to, I think, one of them is 400 pages. So it might not be as, as um, comprehensive as that one psychology book that covers three years, but we are very interested in those textbooks as well. I know one institution has a 6,000-page textbook. Um, if they were interested in an Open SUNY textbook, I would be very interested in working with them, although that would be quite a reading. Yeah, it would. Uh, Mike asks, how much restructuring of staff is going on in those libraries that are participating in this open textbook project? That's an excellent question. I think it's safe to say Geneseo has restructured um, to be much more focused on publishing. Um, so it's allocated staff to being an editor and production manager, a publishing web services developer. Um, we're still looking at the copy editors as a distributed um, pool of librarians and sometimes freelance, as well as proofreading. So it depends. A, a participating library might just participate in the call for authors, the promotion of the program, and uh, supporting it. They might also have someone available to be uh, trained as a copy editor to do the work of copy editing, or just proofreading. However they want to be involved, I want to encourage libraries to participate. So what are they willing to allocate? And what's their interest? At the heart of this, we want to have an impact on the learning environment, because we've always been a part of that learning environment. Increasingly, the new publications are so immersive that they're becoming disruptive to not only libraries, but even to the learning establishments that we're so used to and familiar with. So in terms of uh, the sustainability of this project, can you speak to that, please? That's one of the toughest questions, and, and I think it's an important one. What I've seen is I've looked at the ARL data for the last 10 years, and I can say that they've had a more than 10% decrease in staffing. And yet the price of resources continues to go up. In a sense, our roles in libraries have changed so significantly, we aren't checking in as many print, uh, print journals, that we have to find new roles, new value. So some of the sustainability will be in um, assigning the roles or some of the roles across libraries. And that'll be really key because it provides new value to campuses who value publications. P&T, promotions and tenure require publications. And so can we facilitate that? Can we be a part of it? But more importantly, to fund this program, we are exploring different models of how to sustain it. I really want to see a shared distributed model that builds on the idea of the IDS project, which is a community of support. I think that's fundamental, it's essential, but funding will be key for incentives to authors and even incentives to adoption. And I think the funding will have to come from a combination of soft foundation funding. Um, it could come from libraries who have funding, and um, also it can come from organizations that want to participate in this. 
So I think we'll have to see uh, a very hybridized model that can support this. It will take a small team that's organized on the production and sustainability of it. But ideally, it's inclusive of SUNY libraries, SUNY institutions, uh, CUNY New York institutions, and NI2 New York institutions as well. We have a question from Suzanne, uh, who is asking, how are you finding, training, and evaluating your copy editors, proofreaders? How do you establish criteria for peer review in various subject areas? And how do you identify appropriate peer reviewers? Suzanne, you just asked the question that we were talking about um, just about three hours ago. <laughs> what we're doing is um, we're creating a database or a, a table of all the copy editors that are freelance and the librarians who are interested in this idea. We're going to provide a, a webinar that better explains what we're looking for in copy editors and proofreaders before the next batch of uh, manuscripts are produced. What we want to do is sh explain what it is we're looking for, what it is, um, what are the fundamental pieces, and then if people volunteer for it, we will actually have a, a workshop that's specific to copy editing and a workshop that's specific to proofreading. Each of those are really important skills, but they are very different time commitments and skill sets. As far as evaluations, that's what the managing editor or the editor does when we receive the copy edits back. We review the, the work that the copy editor does. We will be doing assessment of it. And then there will be additional work either with the copy editor or with the training program on how to do this. We think there are a lot of librarians who are interested in copy editing and proofreading because we already see them doing that for their faculty or friends. Um, is this an important enough role for them as university service or um, service to the community? Those are all the things that we have to work out. And these two pilots are helping us do that. So Suzanne, if you have any suggestions, send them my way. And I really sincerely appreciate it. And um, Mike has a question. Awesome project, he says, which I think we all agree. Customer-oriented students and faculty authors peer-reviewed ongoing discussion, evaluation, and market analysis how these texts engage li listeners. So it's really a congratulations. I'm not sure it's a question. Um, but I have a question, um, which I've asked you before, but maybe you can, uh, if you're someone from outside the library, the first question I would have is, you know, why the library? I, I think that's a fundamental question we, we should ask ourselves. And it's key to what I said about our mission has always been about the learning environment. We connect authors to readers. We curate information and knowledge services around learning. What's, what's happening is that that role is increasingly outsourced in commercial publishers that make it very expensive, not only on the reader, but even on the institution. I know we pay, we spend $2,500 on reserves a year just to help support um, reducing the cost of textbooks. If colleges and, and universities are going to control cost and expand access, they're going to have to increase um, a, a level of um, what they're offering their students. And what we can do as libraries is provide content dissemination services that are new but very familiar. They're familiar, familiar to us and to publishers. The question is, is, comes back to, do librarians want to do this? I think if we've seen enough of Megan Oakleaf's uh, valuing academic libraries, and we see the incredible pressure that provosts and presidents are in trying to understand and control cost and deliver more scale, we see that having gone through information ubiquity 15 years ago, we have an answer. We have a role. And it's really the future of libraries supporting the academy and the students and the teachers. 
Great. Well, we're just, that's a wonderful presentation, both Dean and Sorrell. Um, our time is just about up for today. I do want to thank Dean from University of Buffalo Libraries and Sorrell from SUNY Geneseo Mill Library. By the way, our discussions have been recorded and will be available on the NY3R's website. I hope you enjoyed our program today and will join us for our next in the series. We're going to be talking from the team from the Rochester Public Library about their recently held self-published writer's fair. That presentation, which is entitled No More Vanity Using Self-Publishing as Community Engagement, will be March 25th at noon. And you can register now on the NY3R's website. Hope to see you then. And uh, goodbye. Thank you for joining us. And please note there is a link on your screen to a survey we'd ask you to complete. So thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>